you very much for inviting me to speak to you this evening. I am deeply honoured. I've taken as my subject the statement, girls are different. When I was a girl, that would have been seen as not in any way a controversial statement to make. Indeed, people would have asked why one was bothering to say something so obvious. But it is controversial today for a number of reasons. First, there is a movement, small but vocal, which says that gender does not matter. I am the leader of Murray Edwards College at Cambridge University, one of only two higher education institutions for women left in this country. All other colleges and institutions in the UK, but notably not in the US, have become mixed. And occasionally a new student tells me that they think gender is not important and that we therefore don't need a college for women. I always reply, and when all the misogynists and sexists in the world agree with you that gender is irrelevant, we will indeed no longer need organisations and institutions to protect and champion girls and women, but sadly that day has not yet come. Indeed, as I will tell you tonight, I believe that in very many ways, life is worse for girls and young women today than when I was young. A second reason given for ignoring the differences between the sexes in our education system is that in universities today, there are equal numbers of female and male undergraduates, slightly more women in some. Oxford University Students' Union has decided it no longer needs a women's officer. Cambridge University Students' Union has wisely not made that mistake. And it is an error to think that women have won equality in university education because there are equal numbers overall at entry level. Women have always made up slightly more than half the planet. So if equality was all about numbers, we would run the world. <laughs> My college was founded 70 years ago, just a few years after Cambridge University had finally allowed women to be awarded degrees. The university established a quota of 20% for women, and a group of pioneering women said there was a need for a third college to accommodate the potential applicants. At that time, almost all colleges were male only, and of course it wasn't even considered that they might open their doors to women. Our pioneers faced some opposition because a number of <coughs> leading figures at the university said there were insufficient clever women in the whole of the United Kingdom for the 20% quota to be reached. Those women forged on. They tried to raise money by organising a fundraising event at 11 Downing Street, but the event had to be cancelled for lack of interest from potential donors. But they went ahead with their plan for the new foundation, opening the college with an endowment of just £25,000. And if I tell you that today the endowment of Trinity College is more than €2 billion, you'll realise just how brave they were. They opened with just 16 <coughs> students in a cold and leaky old building. But the family of Charles Darwin gave land. The Wolfson Foundation and others funded the construction of a major new building designed by Chamberlain, Powell and Bond before they went on to build the Barbican. May I say, I think Murray Edwards College, now a great two-star listed building, is nicer. <laughs> also, you can actually find your way round. <laughs> and do please visit, because um, the public and school groups are welcome all the time. And we are now also an accredited museum with the biggest collection of women's art in Europe. But the college, from those early days, still struggled financially, despite some other gifts. And nearly 20 years ago, it had become effectively bankrupt, with closing down being the only option that people could see. The then president told me, I sat in my kitchen one night in despair. But then something like a miracle happened. The president 
received a phone call. It was from a former student, Ros Smith. In 1981, Ros had won a place at the college from a comprehensive school in Keithley. She was the first in her family to apply to university. Her father had lost his job and did taxi driving to support the family. Her school didn't encourage her to apply to Cambridge and she had no chance of being crammed in that extra year at school which all the other Oxbridge colleges basically required because you needed to do their special exam. But there was one college at Oxford and Cambridge which did not require that and that was ours. Wanting to encourage girls from state school, they had an alternative entry test and this test tested creative thinking, not cramming with innovative questions such as what is water? And if you applied for physics, you answered what is water? And if you applied for English, you answered what is water? Roz won a place and coming to Cambridge transformed her life chances. But it wasn't always easy. She had a really serious bout of glandular fever early on and didn't know she could keep going. And later on, when she was doing a PhD elsewhere, she also struggled. But even though by the time of her PhD she was at Leicester, it was her old college supervisors back at our college who urged her to keep going and said, you're a brilliant young woman, don't give up. And she went on to succeed massively in life. She founded a highly successful tech business with her husband, Steve Edwards. So, hearing of the college's plight, she rang the president sitting in despair in her kitchen and said, I want to save the college. She said she wanted to give back to the place and the people who had given her so much. She and her family gave us 30 million pounds which was then the biggest donation ever given to a college in Cambridge or Oxford. And rather disgustingly, some people were shocked that they had given such a big donation to a poor college for women. We are not rich now. Our total endowment now is 70 million pounds, not quite Trinity's two billion plus. And we still struggle to fix a leaky roof sometimes but we are here to stay. We now have 600 students, undergraduates and postgraduates, approximately half in STEM and half in arts and humanity. What an inspiring story of women's success in education, you will think. But wait a minute. Remember that 20% quota for women 70 years ago, and this is precisely our 70th anniversary, so obviously ridiculous and, and insulting. Well, today at Cambridge, some, in some subjects, they don't even reach 20% uh, female undergraduates. In computer science at Cambridge, only 17% of undergraduates are women. In maths, it's 19%. Physics and engineering, not much better, 25%. And the figures get worse the higher you go. Fewer at postgraduate level, fewer lecturers, fewer professors. One of our alumni, Hiranya Perez, just became the first woman to be the 1909 Professor of Astrophysics at Cambridge University since, wait for it, 1909. <laughs> this problem is not unique to Cambridge. Fewer than a fifth of engineering, technology and computer science undergraduates in the UK are women. In math, it's just over a third. And these figures demonstrate the massive job still to be done to bring equality for women in education, in schools and in universities. Whatever we have been doing for 70 years in this country, it hasn't worked well enough. A key reason we remain as a women's college is the support we can give those young women in STEM who comprise half our students. Many are in a minority in their lectures and laboratories at the university. I regret to report that they say that the atmosphere is male and not necessarily friendly to women quite often. For them, coming back in the evenings 
to a place where they in the, are in the majority is restful. I should stress, men are welcome to visit our college and stay over, but you have to be invited. <laughs> We're not a convent, but the college is our place. I'm actually disturbed that a number of students have used the same phrase to me, quite separately to each other. When I'm in the college, I'm not on show. I can just be myself. And I think that's terrible that in this day and age, so many young women have said that they feel on show when undertaking their university education. Men sometimes ask what the problem is about being in a minority in study or work, which demonstrates how rarely they experience it. When I first went to work on World in Action at ITV, I was the only woman on the team. Sometimes a man would say, well, what's wrong with that? And I would say that every time I walked into the room, I experienced for a moment that unpleasant feeling a woman gets when she accidentally enters the gents' toilet. <laughs> She's in a place she shouldn't be. While students uh, are in their lectures at the university, Obviously, men are in the majority, but much of the small tuition in the college is in the college where it's women. In that first year in particular, our students say they feel generally less confident. If they are in a discussion with men, they complain male students often talk over them, dominate the conversation and put them down. It is a matter of established fact that men talk more than women in work meetings. Of course, that's not true for me. <laughs> I've learned to stick up for myself, but sometimes men say I've interrupted them, and I say, no, I interrupted you back, but you interrupted me and you didn't even notice. In computer science, we have the biggest single cohort of women at Cambridge University. Our students say the support they give each other is invaluable. They say they feel much more confident about asking questions or giving their views in an environment friendly to women. Of course, over time, they need to build their confidence and having myself won the English Speaking Union's national debating competition at school, I have encouraged the recent formation of a college debating society. And I believe that debating at school was transformatory for me. The nuns at my convent spotted I had talent, or maybe just that I talked a lot, and so they invited a man to come and train me. I had to stand on a big Victorian table. This would never be allowed now. I would be alone in the room with him. And he would give me a topic to say, and the moment I started speaking, he swore at me violently and shouted at me, and I can't even repeat what he said. It was so shocking. I stopped at once, and uh, he said, no, don't stop. You can't stop. And he said, it doesn't matter what men say or do, you just have to keep going. And that is a lesson I have used throughout my life. <laughs> Many of you here will know that girls who do just as well at boy, as boys at GCSE are less likely to go on to do A-level in physics. And then again at A-level, if they do just as well as boys, they are much mes less likely to apply to study physics at university. I highlight physics because if you study physics and maths today, they open the door into fascinating and lucrative careers in fields like AI. Only 23% of those who take A-level physics are girls. By cutting them off from those subjects, brilliant girls are closing down possibilities in their lives, and I would always also say it is damaging our economy. So what can we do? We know that girls are twice as likely to do A-level physics in an all-girls school. I think there is a strong argument for teaching boys and girls separately in some subjects in mixed schools. I believe female school students would benefit from separate teaching in maths and physics for many of the same reasons our students at Murray Edwards say they benefit from having some of their teaching with other women. 
but for boys, some separation may also be beneficial. Our co college alumna, the esteemed Baroness Brown, has pointed out to me that boys would benefit from studying languages separately, potentially. And as there is a crisis in the number of school children opting to learn modern languages, this would be of great benefit. At our colleges, college, we have decided to tackle <coughs> head on the problem of the low number of young women in STEM. We have revamped our outreach to schools to include an innovative new programme targeted directly at encouraging girls to study STEM. In our first year, we aim to reach 200 school girls with a programme of subject-specific activities, virtual conferences, webinars, STEM open days and summer schools, and support for their teachers, which we think is also absolutely key. We would love to have the resource to reach more, but we think that this is a very exciting pilot. For the first time, we will be organising virtual lessons in STEM for schoolgirls. All the students will be chosen by their state schools, and we are particularly reaching out to schools in geographical areas of multiple deprivations. This is not just about helping girls to get good grades, although we will definitely do that, I think. More importantly, we will be increasing their confidence because they will be in a network with other girls. We aim to bring all the girls together to the college at least once during the year. And I think we, we know, those of us involved in education, the huge importance of networks for girls. And in business, we have also learned about the importance of networks. When students first arrive at Murray Edwards, I invite them to visit me in small groups. And I think we've got the father of one who just came round to my house. I always ask, in your class, there was another girl just as clever as you. Why didn't she apply? The answer is invariably the same. She thought she'd be rejected, so just didn't apply. But the girl will say, I thought I'd be rejected, but I'd give it a go. Do you think that any of our leading politicians, men, didn't put themselves up for something because they were worried about rejection? Our alumna, who I mentioned to you, the astrophysics uh, professor, Hiranya Perez, who has now returned to us as a college fellow, talks about the reason why she has succeeded. Hiranya lived in Sri Lanka until she was 16 and found no prejudice in that country against girls studying STEM. I quote her about what she says when she came to Manchester at 16. I didn't know girls were not supposed to be good at maths and physics until I came to England, and by then it was too late to brainwash me. <laughs> Astrophysics is a particularly male world, and Hiranya says she has succeeded because she has a very strong personality and doesn't care if people put her down. But she said to me, why should it be that for a woman to succeed in astrophysics, she doesn't just have to be brilliant, she has to have a very powerful personality. Men can just be brilliant. I like to get out and visit schools myself when I can. Teachers introduce me to girls who have top marks in GCSE and are predicted to get several A-star grades. I've sat in on some of their lessons and seen that they are actually brilliant and not just parroting the right answers. They are the big thinkers of the future, the women who could transform industry, academia and public service using their degrees from a top university like Cambridge. But I have to persuade them that they are good enough to even apply. We have to work together to build girls' confidence. It's as important as giving them a great education. On the day our students line up for their graduation ceremony, I give them two messages. I say that we know women apply for jobs only when they feel they have all the qualifications, but men apply when they have just a few. I say to them, 
Look at Boris Johnson. He applied to be Prime Minister when he had none of the qualifications, and he got the job. I also tell them that they must always ask for a pay rise. Men do so, and they quite often get one. We know that five years after university, women with the same degree as men are on average earning less. Girls are different because so often they undervalue themselves and we must help them to stop doing that. I'm often invited to give talks at girls' schools or women groups and I am invariably asked if I have imposter syndrome, frequently by someone well-meaning who begins by saying something like, we know that all women have imposter syndrome. I fire back at once. I don't have imposter syndrome. I've been a journalist for 47 years and I'm the real deal. And hey, now I'm a president too. I'm definitely not an imposter, but I know a number of men who are. <laughs> My emphasis today on the fact that girls are different is a complete turnaround from what I would have said when I was at university 50 years ago. Then, my young fellow feminists and I stressed our similarity to men. We were fighting the prejudice that girls and women were innately different to men and therefore inferior. It had been claimed only a few decades earlier that women were less intelligent because their brains were smaller. Still, many took the view that women's brains were wired differently so that maths was naturally hard for them. They made poor engineers because they had less spatial awareness and couldn't read maps. Obviously, they couldn't join armies because they would never be able to find the enemy. We were natural homemakers, unsuited to the hurly-burly of working outside the house. Girls were soft and cried, boys and men were tough, and a woman could never be a prime minister or a president. So in line with these stereotypes, society viewed it as right and natural that boys studied woodwork and girls studied sewing and cooking. And may I say, I've always been deliberately rubbish at sewing. <laughs> boys played football because obviously it was an unsuitable game for a woman, something the lionesses have disproved. My own education exemplified these stereotypes. I passed the 11 plus and went to a direct grant convent funded by the state. The Catholic boys' school up the road had properly qualified teachers, but several of my teachers had no degree. My chemistry teacher had left school at 16 without qualifications to join the Free Polish Air Force, but he had always wanted to be a doctor, so naturally, he could teach me O-level chemistry. <laughs> Wisely, in view of the poor teaching, I gave up physics, chemistry, and biology. But what did it really matter? I was a girl, I was middle class, so I would do a nice arts degree and then work as a teacher, ideally at the convent, <laughs> until I married and had children. We had to fight every single one of those prejudices every day. So no wonder we stressed our similarity to men. But now I think it's essential for the success and well-being of girls that we recognize the differences. Almost all the differences are caused by the different treatment we receive at birth and from birth. But gender stereotyping and prejudice have made it different to be a girl and we can't promote their interests properly without recognizing that fact. The differences in the life experiences of girls have been neglected in recent years as a result, and I think that's key to why they're suffering. Some of the differences are physical, and we need to talk about them. Let's start with periods. I learned young never to talk about my periods. I knew girls whose exam results were significantly lower than they should have been because they had awful periods, but that was never taken into account. And of course, a key reason for the lack of research about the subject was that people were too embarrassed to talk about it. A major reason we didn't speak about it was that men made derogatory marks, remarks about how irrational women were when they were on. So we suffered in silence. Girls have periods, it makes them different. 
Here are three facts about periods. A fifth of women bleed so heavily they have to put their normal lives on hold. Between 30 and 40% of women experience symptoms which disrupt their lives. There are 150 documented symptoms of premenstrual syndrome, of which depression is the most common. If we don't recognize this significant factor in the lives of a huge percentage of girls, we are letting them down. And of course, it's the same at the other end of life. The last program I commissioned at Channel 4 was the film about the menopause presented by Davina McCall. As we revealed, a tenth of older women, according to government statistics, leave the workplace because of menopausal symptoms. But until very recently, the menopausal woman with her hot flushes was a figure of fun. I believe that for girls and women to be empowered, they need to control their own bodies at each stage of life. And you can't control your body if you don't know about it and your teachers don't talk about it. One of the major areas where we are failing to support girls is by not teaching them properly when we tell them the facts about fertility. We spend a lot of time telling them how not to get pregnant, but not enough time telling them how you do get pregnant. Although, you seem to know a bit. <laughs> Boys need this information too. We need to teach about fertility so that girls can be aware of the issues they will face when plan planning their lives. We need to encourage them to realise that they shouldn't just be waiting to see what life brings. They need to plan their lives. They have to control their lives and not be swept along by events. I don't think that a woman has to have a baby to be happy, but I know that most women want children at some point in their lives. And I've seen many women who put off thinking about it only to find they'd left it too late. The reasons why women put off having children are diverse. Young women today are educated and ambition to do, ambitious to do great things with their lives. There's much less prejudice against women get, getting great jobs, and they are indeed getting great jobs. But women at work can find themselves under great pressure to delay having children. They often find that they have to climb the ladder in competitive companies. They're expected not to take a career break until they have established themselves. If a woman takes time off to have her children, she may well have to go back to work at a lower grade than before, or even find she can't get back in at all. Some companies offer to pay women to freeze their eggs, and I've seen those organisations lauded, but I think it gives an appalling message. A good company would make clear that you can take time off to have a baby early on in your career if you want to, you shouldn't have to freeze your eggs until your late 30s to get on in life. Increasing number of women work freelance. My own industry, television, has fewer and fewer staff jobs. But in the UK, good maternity pay is tied to a staff job. I know so many young women in television who say they can't afford to stop work and have a baby. That is wrong and society is failing them. And I believe that if politicians are concerned about falling birth rates, they need to rethink how maternity pay works. Those are the sorts of pressures schoolgirls will face in the near future, so we need to talk about it. Girls and boys need to understand the basic statistics about the likelihood of getting pregnant at different ages. And uh, they need also to be able to understand how to check their own fertility. I made a major television series a few years ago about 30 women in their 30s who were trying to have children. Their knowledge and understanding of fertility was weak. To give but one example, one woman said she had assumed she would be a thing she called really fertile, as she put it, because she looked young. Sadly, she discovered that was not true. I caused something of a stir after I became president of Mary Edwards by saying that I would speak openly to students about fertility, telling them about my own story. 
I had a great career in television, but I didn't sit down and think properly about everything I wanted from life until I was in my early 40s. I'd never thought to look at the facts about fertility, and if I had, I would have realised that trying to have a baby when I was 38 was, would have been much easier than in my early 40s. I was lucky I became pregnant. And I don't think it's appropriate for me to lecture adult young women about fertility, but I believe it's the duty of schools to teach re real facts about fertility to girls and boys. We've gone from an era, my mother's, when all that was expected of a young woman was that she would start having babies in her 20s to barely talking about it, and both are wrong. But even more important than this is that we must talk about the crisis in well-being among girls and young women and help them. Here the difference between girls and boys and young women and men is stark. Girls of 16 are twice as likely as boys to say they feel stressed and anxious. By the time they're in their first year at university, the gap has widened still further. Young women in their first year at university are three times as likely to say they feel stressed and anxious. We need to know why. My college has just won funding to examine the experiences of young women across Cambridge University to find out. There are likely to be many reasons. 50 years ago, when I was doing my O-levels and A-levels, society's expectations of me were limited. And I think a key issue now is that we want girls to succeed, but then they feel under extraordinary pressure to succeed. And at the same time, they're undermined constantly. Girl Guiding has been doing brilliant surveys of girls and young women for the past 15 years. The last survey was published in September 2023. They found that 75% of girls and young women between 7 and 21 said that they felt stressed about school, college or work most of the time. The survey demonstrated a steady decline in happiness since it was first done, with girls complaining of online criticism, criticism of their appearance, sexual harassment and unrealistic pressure. The steepest drop in <coughs> happiness was among girls aged 7 to 10, which I think is deeply distressing. Fewer than a third of those were happy. But the levels of happiness fell as girls grew older, with only 8% of women aged 17 to 21 saying they were happy. Of those over 11, 81% said that they had experienced threatening or upsetting behaviour online. 62% had been criticised for their bodies and more than half had been on a diet. There's a major obesity crisis in this country and we cannot think about the education and well-being of girls without facing it. In reception now, 9% of girls in England are obese and by year six, a fifth are obese. Many families in the UK now rely on a diet of ready meals and takeaways. The parents of these children do not themselves know how to cook. I am sure we need to reintroduce cookery lessons for girls and boys. I also favour free school meals, not just because they've been proven to improve performance, but because they model to children what a proper meal is, and that is the attitude taken in France. I could drown you in statistics about how girls are different to boys. 26% of young women experience a common mental health disorder. That's more than three times as many as young men. The rate of self-harm is twice as high. According to the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, 90% of those with eating disorders are female. And you may have heard the way that people speak in, um, I think, quite a patronising way about how the, lev oh, well, the levels of suicide among young men are higher. In America now, 
they are nearly closing the gap. And in this country, the gap is closing. Some charities have called for a national inquiry into the crisis in the well-being of girls and young women, and I agree with them. We cannot just stand by. I am sure that the widespread viewing of violent pornography by girls and boys is a major factor. A survey by England's Children's Commissioner last year found half of children had watched porn by the age of 13, and nearly a third had watched it by the age of 11. 79% of those aged 18 to 21 said they had seen pornography involving sexual violence before they were 18. So perhaps we shouldn't be surprised that 47% of those aged 16 to 21 said girls expect physical aggression in sex, and 42% said most girls enjoy such aggression. There is a review of sex education in schools going on at present. The concern has rightly been that some age inappropriate material is being taught. But my concern is that sex education today inhabits a parallel universe to that in which most children are living. Before they ever have sex, children are getting their ideas of what it is from violent pornography. That pornography degrades girls and depicts a completely unrealistic image of their bodies. We have to address this directly with girls in lessons. Some sex education should obviously be taught separately so that boys and girls can be truthful. We need to talk about porn to expose the lie that it is normal sex. And we need to disabuse boys of the idea that girls like violence and empower girls to say no to it. We discussed this subject recently with alumni at our college and two said that they were teaching sex education in secondary schools but simply felt they didn't have the expertise. One said that on her first day she was handed sex education material and told that all the new teachers, regardless of their subject, did the sex ed. So I would also say that we need to be sure that whoever is teaching is properly trained. It's interesting to see what parents think schools should teach. In a survey last year, the majority said schools should prioritise life skills. I agree. And key to the life skills of girls is talking to girls overtly about the pressures they will face and how to overcome them. Girls are different, but we shouldn't allow that to reduce their opportunities in education and life because, as I learned already from our four wonderful questioners here, girls are great. Thank you. Um, my name is Hazel Bangoff Mann and I'm the headmistress at Haberdasher Girls School in Elstree. Um, and we have a really um, unique offering, I think, um, at Elstree. I'm sure the girls will talk about this in a moment, whereby we are a girls' school, but in the sixth form, our students have the opportunity um, to be taught for at least one of their subjects alongside the boys from the boys' school. I guess my question is, um, thank you for your lecture, really, really interesting. And you spoke about some of the things um, that we can do um, to help, I suppose, empower our students while they're at school. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about what we as educators can do to really instill that inner self-confidence and that self-belief while the students are in our care. Well, I think that I, I've met your students. I think you're. Uh, I, I think uh, you're doing it, um, and 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 ultimately, um, it's about uh, believing in students, but also, as I stressed, 
talking to them openly and honestly about the fears they may have at, at this time in their lives and about what life is going to be like because we see so often girls doing brilliantly well at school and then sort of collapsing at university. And I think, you know, when I said one of the things we're going to look at um, is this um, research we're doing into why are girls in their first year at university three times <coughs> as likely to feel stress and anxiety. Um, I, I think, how can thinking through, how can you prepare them better for the next stage? Thank you. Um, so my name is Maya, and I'm a year 12 sixth form student from Hatcham College. Um, I'm studying biology, chemistry, philosophy and psychology. So as you can tell, I'm interested in going into STEM and I'm passionate about the topic at hand. So I wanted to ask you um, how people, not just like the Department of Education, but like our organisations and the media and like everyone here as well, just people in general, how we can help um, encourage girls to go into male-dominated fields and like help reduce the anxiety? Well, I think, because I'm also in TV, that TV has got a lot better. And I think that the media has improved. It, it's still got a long way to go. I would say it's by not avoiding the issue. And the issue that girls express in sixth form, and I've read quite a bit of research about this, is that they felt that in um, sixth form, they were in a minority, it wasn't very nice for them. So then if their teachers say to them, why don't you do computer science? They think, oh, I, I, I'm, I'm not making this up, this is what the research shows. Oh, I, I'll be in a minority again, in a small minority, and I don't want to be in a small minority. So I'll go and do another subject, and girls often opt for medicine, 70% um, of um, students now in a lot of universities uh, doing medicine are women. So women are going that way, and that's great because we need doctors, um, but why, why did they not go the other way? And universities and schools, how, however they, they are, have got to find ways to deal with this. So at Cambridge now, they have set up a network for all the girl, young women and female lecturers in the department so that they can make themselves a network. And in many ways, what I was describing tonight is that our college is like a women's network to support you in a male world. Um, hello, I'm Savinia, um, and I'm a Year 12 student at Haberdashers Elms Tree. Um, and you spoke a lot about empowering women and how they can build their confidence at a single sex college. Um, but what are the other benefits you can get at a single sex college, and are they the same as going to a single sex school? It's not at all like a single sex school because I went to a single sex school <laughs> and there were no men staying the night. <laughs> Uh, um, so, uh, I, I think, uh, for me, I was a bit surprised when I, I didn't go to Cambridge and um, the college approached me and I thought, what is this place? This is unusual and strange, but now I love the fact that it's a different place and I think that through our experience at this college, we can, we're learning things that can help other people and, and it's particularly that thing about a network. But the other one is that um, people couldn't walk around their pyjamas at night <laughs> and um, they really like that. Um, so, uh, I, and I thought that was quite funny when I came because there'd been all this row about pyjama mums in Kentish town <laughs> and then uh, to see all these Cambridge students because they just feel so relaxed. Um, so I think those would be two advantages. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Sarah and 
name is Abina. I'm a sixth form student at Hatcham College. I study English, politics and philosophy. And on top of that, I went to an all-girls secondary school. So my question was, do you predict an increase or decrease in radical misogyny as a result of like segregated teaching between boys and girls? No, I actually think you'll get less misogyny by tackling some of the issues and by talking about the issues and the problems. I always take men on directly if they try any of that misogyny stuff. But I also feel, you know, I can educate them. So I talked about periods. When I worked in TV, uh, a man said he was just nipping out to the shops. Could he get me anything? And I said, oh yeah, can you get me um, um, li some lilettes, please? Super. And he went, what? What? You expect me to go into a shop and buy tampons? And um, anyway, I helped him. I don't know. I, I, I gave him a long lecture. Um, I don't know if he's yet able to buy tampons. But, um, you know, for me, you, I, I know it's easy for me because I'm older, but I call out misogyny wherever I see it. I have absolute zero, uh, and then I educate people, and being educated about misogyny by me is worse than the Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> so they soon learn not to do that. Thank you. Uh, my name is Omi. I take history, economics, and psychology, and my question was, why do you think women feel, um, women undervalue themselves and don't reach for those top opportunities? Because we come from a society and a culture where uh, women have been undervalued for hundreds of years, and so we're not suddenly going to be able to as an individual, step outside society and, and value ourselves. It, it's going to be a challenge for us. I, I, now, this might surprise you, but some days I don't feel completely and utterly confident. Um, and I think it's, um, it, it's about combating it in yourself. And, um, one thing that I try to do is, if I'm feeling unsure about something, I think, well, what small thing could I do? And I'll, I'll give you an example. One of my students said that she felt at the Students' Union at Cambridge, uh, she couldn't just uh, stand up and speak for herself. And that was why we thought, well, we would start a debating society within the college where we could do it ourselves. So I think it's about small steps and recognising that that person that you think is you saying, I'm not great, isn't you. That society inside you and you, you have to rid yourself of it. But it also, if you feel it, you, you shouldn't feel bad about it because, and, and I've, I've done this myself and I've also seen a lot of women go, so they blame themselves for putting themselves down. So it's a sort of double blame. But I, I also think it's um, about joining up with other women. And one of the things I said to that um, young woman was, don't go alone to the Students' Union, or the Cambridge Union, it's different to the Students' Union. Why don't three or four of you go together and sit near each other? So I think helping each other is absolutely con uh, uh, important. Thank you so much for your talk, I really enjoyed it. My name is Charlotte Harmon, I'm um, Deputy Head of Haberdashers Adams in charge of Six Women Girls, so I've got a really good opportunity to put a lot of what you've been saying into practice. Um, I just wondered what you think I can do in my position. Um, we're going co-ed in September, so we're starting to take year seven girls. We're currently co-ed in sixth form. What can I do to help the girls from falling over, as you put it, at university? Would you suggest that's through subjects like physics and teaching them separately, or through PSHE? 
and that sort of thing yeah, increase in their res resilience? I think it's, um, it's both. I mean, um, we, we live in a world of men and women where this is not about uh, keeping women separate forever. Um, so I think it, it really is worth thinking about teaching specifically maths and physics separately. And secondly, it's about creating groups just for girls. I think that's very important. And it's not exclusionary. You can also create groups just for boys as well. Um, so that boys don't think, oh, girls are getting something special. But there's got to be a place for girls. I don't think that um, girls at school should be expected to be in a mixed setting all the time, all day. I just think that's too much. Um, thank you so much for your lecture. Uh, much of what you said resonated as somebody who went to a single sex school, studied STEM. Um, I now lead a co-educational school. What resonated with me was uh, your story about the debate with the gentleman that coached you standing on a table. Also horrified me a little bit um, as a head teacher. Um, but it seems that those sorts of opportunities were seminal to making you the woman you are today, formidable woman, I might add. Um, and also, we don't, as you said, we don't uh, live in this world alone, we coexist with males. So how do we recreate those opportunities and enable young women to be able to have the confidence, to be able to, I suppose, uh, advocate for themselves um, in a safe um, environment? Well, I, I specifically, I think having a girls debating society, which uh, as well as a mixed debating society, is a very good idea. I would really uh, recommend that. And uh, girls general debating and discussion groups. But I think it's so important to make time for these things. And I feel very concerned about the way the curriculum now is so much more limited than it was in my time at school. In my time at school, there was more opportunity to discover yourself by doing maybe what appeared like quite random things. And I think the problem in some schools now is that um, pupils spend far too much of their time just studying the subject and that's why when they come out into the real world, they fall apart. And, and we need to be teaching resilience in the school to help them for the real world. Any other questions? Oh, many questions. Good evening. Thanks very much indeed for the lecture. Um, my daughter is, my granddaughter is now five weeks old. So how optimistic should I be that her education in 17 or 18 years time will meet the challenges that you've articulated this evening? And what can we do to support that? Well, I, um, I am an optimistic person. Um, I think that the, um, best way to support a girl as she is growing up is to encourage her to question everything around her. And I often say to people um, that my sisters and I um, have done well in life because we just decided as a, a matter of course, whatever our parents said, believe the opposite and you wouldn't be going far wrong. Um, uh, because they were very, very conservative people. So I think it's encouraging uh, people to, uh, especially girls, to challenge what they see around them. Because so much of what we see as girls and women is uh, about um, being put down. I even think of you know, David Cameron saying, 
calm down, dear, in the House of Commons, and he's supposed to be like a nice person, but inside him, he was still one of those blokes who need to help. With your media hat on, I mean, you were talking about it's really important to kind of get messages across, but you know, what we're seeing now is more fractionalism, you know, the message is getting dissipated, there's so many different channels, they're quite binary in things, so complex issues just get kind of boiled down to black and white, yes and no. How do, how do you still kind of get that message across in a way which is consistent and actually really is going to drive the change when it sort of feels like it's going the opposite way? Yes. Well, I feel very, very strongly uh, that in this country we are lucky to have regulated television and as a result, 73% um, of people um, watch, I've never worked for the BBC, I should say, I wouldn't ever want to, but 73% of people in this country watch it. 69% of people in this country trust the BBC. So we have very high levels of trust in broadcasting because it's regulated. And it's all regulated. ITV's regulated, Channel 4. In fact, I think one of the problems with GB News is that the regulator are not actually making them adhere to the rules. So one thing is that we need to you know, keep our regulated television and not make the error that the Americans made where they got rid of it and they ended up with things like Fox News, which directly undermine democracy. But you're also talking there about disinformation and misinformation in social media. And that is a much more complex issue. But we, at the, the starting point has to be that government um, holds social media to account. And I think they're getting it now, but for years and years, um, the British government and many other governments said, oh, social media, what can we do about it? Well, you can do a lot about it. You're the government. And, and we were too weak. Um, but I do think, turning back to education, that we have to teach children about disinformation and misinformation. We have to prepare them for a world of lies that fundamentally begins when they're about eight or nine. Um, so uh, I, it's... It, potentially, it's the biggest single issue that we are that, that we are going to face, and your baby granddaughter is going to face, is the lies of social media. I'm a very proud father of four children. My youngest daughter, you mentioned forces, has joined the army at the age of 17. Indeed, joined the military, joined the infantry at the age of 17. She tells me that the the, the pool of girls, women. Um, is, is narrowing, and as she enters the second stage of t training, um, she'll be the only girl left over Gosh. within the, the infantry. And she's chosen to make that choice to go forward. But I wonder what your thoughts are as a parent who's obviously very proud of her daughter and what she's trying to achieve and really carving a, carving a, a line for herself, but actually as a terrified parent thinking that my daughter, my baby daughter, could be in a war zone in three years' time, surrounded by men, which is the way it appears. Yeah, well, of course, one of the problems that the military has had has been this huge stream of stories of young women being sexually abused in ways that I wouldn't even describe in this company. Absolutely horrifying. Um, everybody knowing about it, nobody doing anything about it. And to be honest, when you said you were worried for your daughter, I thought that you were going to say because of the men she was fighting with, not the men she was fighting. If you enter the uh, military, you might expect that the danger you face would be the enemy, not your fellow soldier. Um, and I, I, it, you really shocked me when you say she's the only one left. And she is going to need 
a lot of overt support and the men around her are going to need a lot of education um, to deal with what is a very difficult situation but if she comes through it I mean she could potentially be a really strong leader to encourage other women um, as for war I think my, I think we're all um, we're all frightened at the moment of the, of the future. Um, but I and often my students actually I know it's not what we're talking about. Often my students say to me, "This is um, this is the worst time there's been." They 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 have this sense this is the worst time they've been. Whereas because I was born in 1952, I had the opposite feeling. I, I wasn't in a war, and my father would talk to me about being in Burma and, and thinking that he would die. So I always had this sense of my father didn't die, and um, the war has ended. So my attitude of life was positive and I think for boys and girls at the moment um, there's a really serious problem about them being um, depressed and hopeless and I, I don't know the answer to that but I have really noticed it and in so many ways their lives are not worse and not more threatened than 70 years ago. I, I mean, my father brought me up to believe that we were going to have a nuclear war and trained me in what to do in a nuclear war, which was not cheery. Um, uh, so I, it's a different point, but it, it's something as people in education, we have to be really aware of. We were talking a lot about, is one of the problems we have about advocating for women in high positions, potentially in STEM, in politics, in many areas. For Westminster itself, people making the decisions is a very unfriendly environment for women, not just in terms of the attitude and how women are spoken to, the attitude they get from online trolling, but also the general practicalities of being an elected representative that we were saying if you were on maternity leave, how, how does that even work? And my, my thoughts were along the lines of how do we tackle that those that are directing how the country is run, we are still having to tackle their workplace, how it runs in terms of being women, family friendly, and then how that impacts on future decisions. Does that make well, sense? Well, I, I think now um, for women in politics, I was horrified that I think three women now get the sort of level of protection that the royal family gets. And, you know, we've worked so hard to ensure that there are more women in Parliament. But now, I mean, I don't, I, 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 I've got to be honest with you, if a young relative of mine said she wanted to be an MP, I would be... I would be worried and I think that um, as a society we have been slow to recognize um, how women over a number of years the the way that they've been undermined and harassed on social media and insulted and followed has just been increasing more and more and more <coughs> and and you know, now they are being directly attacked and we've stood by and not done enough as it's built up and personally I think that there should be very severe penalties for anybody who uh, harasses, threatens or attacks an MP and if we don't do that our democracy is at risk talking about um, women in politics, how do you reflect on, uh, given your views on Margaret Thatcher? Oh, Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> well, um, 
Well, I'll say something about Margaret Thatcher, um, which is that Margaret Thatcher worked incredibly hard and um, uh, she didn't do any exercise or um, lead a healthy life. She didn't make enough time in her life for um, friendships. And um, in her later years, where I, for various reasons I knew um, a bit about her, because we happen to have the same autoimmune disease, which may potentially mean we're related, which is <laughs> uncanny. Um, she, um, she cut a sad figure. And I think, um, you know, uh, to some extent, she put on an act that she was harder than a man and everything. But the message I take away from Margaret Thatcher is, the way to be as a woman leader is not to live your life like a man. It's not to overwork. It's not to neglect friendship. It's not to do no exercise. It's not to not eat right. You, it, you know, you've got to live in a, you've got to live in a healthy and happy way. Just taking the questions back to the subject of STEM again. Um, mm -hmm. When I was at school, I was the only girl in my further maths A level class, and I think the thing that taught the boys in my class that maths wasn't a subject just for them was the fact that I was there and I was just as good as them. So I completely hear you that for the girls' experience of STEM subjects, it may be beneficial to them to be in segregated classrooms, but how will we stop the boys then from developing their traditional misogynistic views in that scenario? That's a very, uh, that's a very good point. So maybe you have to have some things together as well. Uh, Hiranya Perez actually tells a very funny story at her comprehensive in Manchester where, as I, I said, you know, she was just spectacularly good at maths and physics and she kept being given extra work by the teacher to encourage her and the boys complained that she got lots of extra work, <laughs> which I thought was hilarious. And she said that the teacher said to them, OK, I'll give you loads of extra work as well if you think you can do it. Um, but yes, you, you make an excellent point. Thank you very much. I think we'll need to close the questions now because supper is waiting for us. So I shall pass the microphone to the Master. Thank you. Um, uh, there are t two, two women in my life who I rather wish had heard uh, tonight's lecture and indeed this fantastic panel discussion. Um, the first is my grandmother, who got a first in maths at Oxford in the 1920s, just at the end of the First World War, uh, and who was never really allowed to flourish. Um, she was a bit of a role model for me. Uh, and the second is our daughter, who made me read Invisible Women. Uh, and um, uh, I haven't felt so stirred on the subject since I read that book. Uh, she will watch this, because it's been filmed happily and she's a member of the company and she'll be cheering from the rafters. Uh, there is so much meat in this evening's discussion, the lecture in particular, that I for one look forward to reading it, studying it, and I hope we can act on it. I'm particularly interested in the initiative in relation to STEM subjects uh, and would like to continue that conversation if we may, and also the networking idea uh, which uh, clearly I won't be playing a part of, uh, but uh, perhaps should perhaps be finding a good foothold here. Uh, all I want to do really is thank you so much for a hard-hitting, humorous, salutary, uh, excellent, fascinating lecture. To thank our, our students and, and members of staff too um, for joining the discussion on the panel. Um, uh, and. Um, it's been quite a busy uh, haberdasher day here today. We've got uh, all our lead educators here, uh, governors uh, and guests as well. I'd like you all please to uh, show your appreciation for Dorothy Byrne and our panel. Thank you so much. <laughs>